Good evening. How are we doing? <laughs> My name is Marina. I'm a singer and a songwriter. Um, I have a small confession to make, actually. I was asked to come and talk here about five or six years ago. And whilst I was very honoured, I was also very, very terrified. Um, and so when I was asked again three or four months ago by your very kind um, President Stewart, I leapt at the opportunity because I started to see giving a talk not as me doing my best impression of a professional human being, but rather um, telling a story. Songwriting is very much connected to storytelling for me, and that's what I consider my craft. So tonight, I'm going to be talking about the power of pop music, fans, and the songwriting industry. So I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about my background. I am half Greek, half Welsh. I've lived in both countries. And at the age of 18, I moved to London. My background in terms of music is quite strange because the truth is I had no background. So I'd never sung in front of anybody. I'd never written a song. And I had given no indication whatsoever that I wanted to be a pop artist until I was 19. So I was quite a late starter. But deep down, I had always had this really strong attraction, was very drawn to the idea of using music as a way of communicating. So as a child, I, was, I wasn't shy, but I was quiet. And I had a lot of, I found it really difficult to express negative feelings. So whether that was me feeling sad or angry or worried, I never expressed it, and I was very good at hiding it. So music was actually, it provided me with a, a safe forum or, you know, a safe environment to express and communicate things that maybe I didn't feel comfortable talking about in person with people, um, be that friends or, or family. So at 19, I started to songwrite, completely winging it. Um, I had taught myself how to play keyboard, really basic standard. And songwriting became a form of, of self-counsel. So for a lot of artists coming into the industry, a lot of us really want to be artists. We love the, the lifestyle, the allure of the image, you know, money, fame, praise. And then some of us need to be artists. And I really relate to the latter, because the reason that I wanted to be a pop artist was not because of imagery or money or any of those types of things. It was because I felt that songwriting um, was the only thing that made me feel at peace and really happy. So it really became something that actually was self-serving in a way. It was really helping me psychologically. Now, I want to talk about the power of pop and why I think that pop music can be powerful. I wanted to make <coughs> pop music not for its sound, but because I saw it as a really clever tool that I could use to, um, I suppose, express unorthodox ideas to a really large audience. And a quote that I used in my MySpace biography when I was starting out, <laughs> R.I.P. <laughs> um, was that I was an indie artist with pop goals. And what I meant by that was that I was acknowledging that I was going to be working within an industry whilst not becoming part of that industry. So from the start, I was very clear about the fact that I was being strategic in using pop music as a medium to um, express my own views. and. And that involved a lot of social commentary in the beginning. Uh, with my first album, I had songs like Hollywood, I'm Not a Robot. Then with Electra Heart, I, I was dissecting, the, I suppose, the, the female character in a way. Um, and so it was very useful for that. 
So why do I believe pop can be powerful? Because on the surface, it can and is very much considered as light entertainment. It can be silly and fun. It can be considered frivolous, sometimes superficial. And it is all of those things. But it's also a way of documenting social history. Something that I've always been obsessed with is the idea of zeitgeist, something that is defining the spirit or mood of our times. And I feel like pop music has been the perfect uh, tool to, to capture and communicate that. I almost see it as a, a mirror in a way, which is reflecting the time that you're all living in. So if you ever want to find out something about this moment in time, in any kind of society or culture, you look to its popular art. So that could be fashion, film, um, theatre, architecture, music, of course. And you can get a really good gauge for the, the attitudes that are inherent in that culture. So we can find out a lot about anything from attitudes towards women, race, um, sexuality, money, class, uh, religion. And so it's, for me, it's, it's not just something that's light entertainment. It's something that encapsulates um, and communicates a very specific period in time. Um, one of my favorite artists is an expert at doing this, and she is called Madonna. Um, for me, she has always been a perfect example of someone who absorbed the zeitgeist and certain you know, subcultures that she was dipping into and communicating that on a global level. But it wasn't just about you know, how she looked and being provocative. It wasn't about fashion for me. It was you know, also about communicating the problems of the time to be that attitude towards homosexuality, um, HIV or feminism. Moving on into the, the topic of, of fans and being a fan of somebody, I feel like it's really a relevant topic tonight because my relationship with my fans is quite unique and they have been instrumental in the way that I've chosen to steer my career both strategically and creatively. To take you back to the start, um, my beginning was very grassroots. As I said, I mentioned MySpace before. I started on, on there, and I handmade EPs, and I would send them off to people and charge them through PayPal. <laughs> and <laughs> um, I would also do this with T-shirts. But I also really enjoyed, um, I suppose, finding like-minded individuals. And that was part of the reason why I created Marina and the Diamonds. It wasn't Marina Diamandis, the solo artist. It was that I, in my head, I really wanted to conjure up this image for people of a group of people that, you know, I suppose focused on the idea that music unites people and it unifies people as well. It kind of, you know, it, I'm sure some of you have found some of your good friends just through liking the same bands and artists. And that's <clears throat> that kind of connection isn't something that you can synthesize. So it was something that I'd cultivated from day one. The internet has been really instrumental in how I've communicated with fans. Uh, I watched a documentary recently called I'm a Pop Star. And basically, they were interviewing pop stars from the 80s and 90s. And I found it so weird, because they were talking about fan bases and how sometimes they'd go on, on, on stage and they'd be scared that they'd like be jeered or booed off. And they, they kind of saw fans as this, this like uncontrollable public, whereas I feel so different, and I'm not sure whether other artists do too, but I feel like social media has bridged that gap between artists and fans. So for me, it affords me an understanding of my fans' lives and them as individuals, and vice versa, I hope. Um, you know, they can see that I am just another person as well. 
My career as an artist has been a bit of an anomaly and I think that's down to the fact that I'm not very easy to categorise. Sometimes that can be detrimental in that when it comes to media, um, it's much easier to talk about an artist if they're easy to classify. But it's also been to my advantage because I think when a fan finds me, if they like me, they seem to like really like me. And that <laughs> makes for a really passionate and loyal fan base. My latest record, which is called Fruit, is a, a great example of this, um, of how a, a modestly sized fan base can provide a lot of support for an artist. So before Fruit, uh, I had just got done with my album Electra Heart. I had received quite a lot of commercial pressure in making that record. And this time, I didn't want to write for the radio anymore. I didn't want to kiss people's asses. I just wanted to make the record that I wanted to make. And I believed that I could do that without having to compromise things and like play the game. So what I did was I made my own strategy. <laughs> and basically, my manager and I went to my label and presented it. It was an unusual strategy because it wasn't a singles-led campaign. It wasn't chasing hits or top 40 radio. So this campaign was called Fruit of the Month. Now, the basis was that if you pre-order my album, I'll send you a new fruit or song every month. And with that song, I will also give you a brand new visual, visual world to indulge in. So that was, you know, GIFs, videos, uh, new photos, scratch and sniff vinyl, a whole world which you could experience the album through. And that's one way that I love connecting with fans, is building this visual world. So I believe that if I proved to people the strength of the material strong, song by song, then I would hope that they would trust me enough to uh, buy the record, and, and they did. The campaign as a whole um, is an example of how a modestly sized fan base can provide a lot of support and success for an artist without them having to compromise anything. So despite getting no radio play, Fruit went to number eight in America. It sold about 45,000 records in its first week. Um, and it also went top 10 in the UK. So what it comes down to is not how many fans you have, but what type of fans you have. And I'm very, very grateful that I have this kind of fan base. The last section of my talk is about the songwriting industry. It's changed quite a bit over the past 10 years. The way that people write records and the type of music they write has changed because basically the music industry doesn't make as much money as it used to and the labels are very mad about that. So this has had a knock-on effect on how people write songs because the focus is on, on you know, selling records and, and getting money. So the pressure to write a hit is even, even bigger it means that people now write for radio and commercial success more than they write for just artistic or political or social expression. And this, for me, is really damaging because it results in a huge lack of variety on radio, which is something that I would love to ask you guys about later on. Mainstream radio is still one of the most successful platforms to launch music on, but it's one of the least challenging and I find that so frustrating because when I listen to national youth stations in the UK, I feel like I'm hearing one type of music and one type of theme or lyric, um, largely anyway. And that lyric is very much about getting drunk in a club or like, look how amazing I am. <laughs> Now, I love to get drunk in a club. <laughs> I love those songs. Um, and I love pure pop as well. It's not, it's not about genre, it, but it's just more about having variety on radio. And I think when you listen to radio and there's only one type of song playlisted, 
it basically drives home the message to artists that you need to dumb down your material in order to be successful. And I don't believe in that. I think it's so, so damaging. My own experience in the songwriting industry really began at, um, at the start of writing Electra Heart. So my first album, I'd mainly written on my own. I'd done a few co-writes. And then my label saw a potential there to be bigger. And I was very, very strongly encouraged to write with very successful, talented American songwriters. So after about six months, I was just like, OK, fine, <laughs> I'll do it. And I went through a rigorous time of um, doing a lot of different sessions. And it was kind of like my version of university. It was really intense, sometimes not very fun, but very eye-opening. Um, and I feel like my main thing that I took away from that was that it did teach me how to expand myself creatively when songwriting, but I hated how there was an expectation for your individuality to be ironed out in order to succeed. So I was basically in, in the wrong place. I was working in the wrong place. Now, this isn't to say that I'm against co-writing or co-writing sessions. I'm just, I'm against songwriting by committee. I don't think it encourages creativity or freedom of speech um, or individual thinking. And last night I was thinking actually of examples of artists in the past who, who have been political or have just had that kind of essence to them that is, I believe is lacking today. And I thought of um, singers like Billie Holiday, David Bowie, Bob Dylan, Joanna Baez. Those types of artists are really hard to come by. And I know that we have to change, and we do have amazing artists these days who, who are political and, and they, you know, they have voices, but there's, it's the idea of, of being you know, risky or taking a risk is not encouraged at all. Needless to say, I decided to write Fruit completely alone. It felt very much the right decision creatively. But I also wanted to address this assumption um, that women don't really write the music, at least in pop. It's like, if you look a certain way and you have a certain visual, do you also write the music? Like, I feel, I feel like men are very much credited more than women. And so with this, there was nothing to hide behind. It was like, well, you can see the credits. So that was my way of addressing that and hopefully encouraging other people, whether it's um, male musicians or female musicians, to, to write on their own more often and to rely on themselves creatively. I'd like to end my talk today by saying that I believe that pop music can be powerful and it can be political. Songs are great storytellers and a way of, of capturing a moment in time. And music can be used as an instrument for progression and for change. Thank you so much for your time and your attendance. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, as normal, I'll begin by asking a few questions myself, and then after that, I will open up to audience questions. So my first question for you this evening um, is about how you used to write your uh, music behind your Electra Heart persona. Yeah. Uh, and I was just wondering, why is it that you wanted to separate yourself from your music in that way? Um, I think because I felt like I was being really uh, pushed into this by my label. And I thought, and it's hard because I, the way that in which I think is, it's very much, I consider both options and both sides all the time. So I'm always weighing up what's, what's the best or right option. And for this, I couldn't really decide because on one hand, I didn't feel like that kind of um, very high octane pop uh, sound was my sound or part of my identity. 
But also at the same time, it was an amazing opportunity to work with people like Stargate, who's written Rihanna's Rude Boy, um, Dr. Luke, who'd done a lot of work with Katy Perry. These were really interesting figures in the songwriting industry. And so I thought, OK, fine, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it as somebody else. <laughs> And so that's why I created this persona, because I didn't feel like the sound was true to me, but I still wanted to be the creator. And uh, what, what does that persona mean to, you, mean to you now? Do you still feel a connection, a connection to it? Or? No, I feel like it's weird. When I look at it, I feel like it's somebody else, because it kind of was. And, you know, it's very much like playing a part in a musical. So. I saw it as an expression of that time. And actually what I was doing was dividing the, um, <clears throat> the, I suppose, the album into female archetypes. And so in a way, like I was talking before about pop music being a mirror, I was reflecting what I was seeing every day. And prima donna can very much be a reflection of uh, personality types like Kim Kardashian, Paris Hilton, which we all think on the surface, oh, you know, whatever, how is that important? But there's a reason why people are paying attention to them. So I was kind of reflecting that back. <laughs> uh, leading on from that, you, uh, you spoke in your talk about how um, people in the pop industry often feel the need to dumb themselves down. Um, and you've said before that um, in interviews following your Electra Heart album, you felt like the questions you received were very dumbed down and superficial. And I was wondering, that have you noticed a difference in that since you decided to write all your material by yourself? Hugely. Like, I couldn't even tell you how much, how much of a difference there's been. Um, it's quite shocking, actually. And it, it, when I started doing interviews after Prima Donna, I, I thought, God, I really feel sorry for real pop stars, because <laughs> this is the type of stuff that they get every day. And, and again, that assumption that I wasn't making the music was there again. So it's a very different world. And you know, an image is very powerful. You have to be careful with it. And how do you think that we can move away from the kind of homogenous nature of radio music that you spoke about in your talk? Or do you think it's just reflective of the society that we now live in? I think it's getting better. At least I hope. Um, I mean, radio, for example, in America is quite different. The format is, um, is different. They have thousands of radio stations across America, and they are all categorized into R&B, pop, um, and alternative. So if you fall in between any of those, then it's like, good luck, because you're not getting on the radio. <laughs> um, whereas over here, I do, I do think stations like Radio 1 are are different and they do play different types of music but in that kind of daytime slot it's all it's all the same and I feel like the only way that it can change is a by talking about it at events like tonight um, but also by encouraging songwriters and artists to be um, less compromising with their labels because usually this, the artist knows has a better instinct for what suits them than their record label will. Mm. Uh, on a different topic, uh, you said you write as a self-serving self um, mechanism, but in order to be successful, do you think that you have to write your music with particular fans in mind, or do you just write it for yourself and hope that there's other people out there that feeling the same things yeah. that you're feeling? <laughs> yes, definitely <laughs> the latter. Definitely. It would be too stressful to try and write for other people. And actually, Every time that I've done an album, I've kind of been told or warned that, oh, you might lose your fan base. And I thought, well, if that happens, that happens. And actually, it has, it has happened in different ways. Like with Electra Heart, a lot of the indie fans dropped off. But then I gained, actually, what, what is my fan base today. Um, so I think you'll always get that. And I, I definitely don't think you should write for your fan base, no. Um, and so since your songs are um, so personal and often about um, personal relationships that you've had, is it really hard putting it out very publicly when you maybe know that a song that you've written might hurt someone that you know or have <laughs> been about um, your yeah. relationship in that way? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I actually said to my boyfriend the other day, I was like, 
If you're, do you think it's harder to write when you're married? Because if you write a song about your husband, that and you're like you're you're stuck with him, then <laughs> like what are you gonna do? At least if you do it about a boyfriend, you know the relationship's probably over. So, <laughs> so yes, it's difficult, and I guess I can't care because that's. That's what's part of being a songwriter is your need, or any kind of writer, but it's your need to document your life. So it's part of the deal. And do you think that you write about your relationships in the same way that Taylor Swift does? <laughs> <laughs> do you? <laughs> um, no, I don't. I don't think so. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on, um, yeah. you <laughs> said again in your talk that you like to explore really unorthodox um, views in your um, songs and I was particularly interested about your song Savages and how that's uh, largely about rape culture. Um, I was just wondering if you'd be able to expand a little about, bit about your thoughts behind this song <coughs> and also maybe what you think is the best way to tackle rape culture and if we need to approach it differently to how we have been. Mm. That's an interesting question because it's such a, a, a relevant topic. However, with Savages, um, what led me to writing that song was I was reading an article, I think in the Times, and it was um, about the Boston bombings. And the journalist was saying how it's so hard for him to reconcile in his mind how you know, one man can be running a race to raise money uh, you know, to save other people's lives, and then another man can be plotting to blow himself up or, you know, building a bomb. And I thought that there was real poetry in that, that for all of us it's very hard to um, comprehend and to accept that there are two sides to human nature. So that song was very much, it wasn't actually um, condemning anything, you know, about murder or war or, or people having an animalistic side. It was more just acknowledging it. And I mean, sometimes I think about uh, about you know why why do why does rape happen? Why do men rape, rape women? Because it's it's something that I'm assuming has happened for you know thousands and thousands of years, and instead of uh, punishing people or kind of taking a view of condemning it. I, I'm way more interested in the psychology behind it, why it happens, um, and whether it's symptomatic of culture or, you know, society at the time, or it's just something inbuilt, you know, just as other types of mental illness are. So it's, a, it's an interesting one. In terms of your question about, you know, how we can, how to do something about rape culture, I don't have the answer, but I think my way of, of dealing with it is writing songs like that, that at least encourage people to think about it. Because the only way that change happens is, is through thought. So hopefully it's, it's contributed to that. Thank you. Uh, the last question for me is just, you mentioned at the start about how um, obviously you're Welsh and Greek. And I was just wondering, do you still feel a strong connection to your Greek and Welsh heritage? Or? Yeah, I do. I do, very much so. I've spent most of my life in Wales, but I very much feel Greek as well. And it's something that I'd like to delve into more over the next year when I get time off. Because it's, my, my Greek upbringing has had a big impact on me as an artist and just pers person as well, character. And it's something that I want to celebrate, and I think they they need that at the moment. And that I, you know, I definitely want to be open about the fact that I I'm proud to be Greek. Um, as for the Welsh side, of course, I'm proud to be Welsh as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess I have more ease with that side just because I've lived there and I've lived with my mum for much of my life. So, yeah. Great, thank you. So I'll uh, open up questions um, from the floor now. I'll start off with a question in the third row. Remember there? 
Hi, um, do you have a particular songwriting process, like a journal that you keep or a setting that you need to be in? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Do you have a particular songwriting process? Oh, um, yes. It's called voice memo on my iPhone. <laughs> Or just memo. <laughs> um, yeah, I write a lot of things down on my iPhone. Previously, I would carry a little book about with me. Um, but usually it happens when I'm either walking or I'm on some mode of transport. And that's the only way in which I write. I never write music first. It's always about um, having been inspired by a particular, I don't know, it could be it could just be a word that I really like. Like with Prima Donna, I had the title for about three months before actually writing the song. And same with Savages as well. Um, I just had the two, first two lines of the chorus. So it it's always starts with lyrics. Uh, if I go for the member in the pink coat. <laughs> hey, hey. Um, I remember a few years ago in the Electra Heart period watching a video or an interview of you in which that you, you talked about how you were reluctant to like, collaborate with people on albums because it was like you know you wanted to take control of it so like firstly I'd like to say like well done for doing that with Fruit that's really impressive um, mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you've been able to get that um, I guess my question was about that and about how wondering whether or not in future you'd be willing to collaborate with maybe like a female artist in a more empowering way rather than like letting it take over your work as an artist who does producing and stuff yeah. like that. But, like, um, yeah, I would definitely be open to it. Definitely. And I think collaboration's brilliant if it's not um, farcical or if it's, you know, if it's not pushed on you uh, again for like, because it's a great commercial idea. So I've actually collaborated with um, a band recently and I think it will come out this year. But I would love, I would actually love to collaborate with more, with more artists. Um, it's weird because you actually don't get to hang out with artists very often. <laughs> Everyone thinks it's like some giant club, but it's not. <laughs> do, you, do you have a dream person that you'd wish to collaborate with or? Oh God, it's so difficult. Because there are artists I love, like Fiona Apple, or Madonna, Britney Spears, but I don't know if it'd be appropriate to, <laughs> <laughs> to collaborate with them. Um, yeah, I love Roikstop, actually. I'd love to do something with them. So actually, one person that I'd love, Daniel Johnson. He's a, a DIY artist. Um, and he's about 50 now, but he's like one of my heroes. So yes, I would say him. If I go for the member in the red scarf, just on the second row. Hi, um, I love you, by the way. Just thought I'd get that out there. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say, obviously, with all of your albums, you've kind of had a big concept around it. So like with Fruit, you had the pinball stuff and then all of the costumes with your tour. Yeah. How do you go from the songs to creating that big image? And do you think it's something that starts at the very beginning that you're thinking about the whole way through? Or is it something that comes together a bit more when you're thinking about the marketing side of things? Mm. It's definitely not something that you have from the start. And this lady over here is my manager. And <laughs> this is Jess, by the way. <laughs> and um, she knows all about the process because with fruit, you know what? I was starting to think, God, Marina, you need to pull something out of the bag soon because I had no idea about what kind of visual I wanted. I had no, it's not a concept record lyrically or thematically. Um, so I was, I was kind of, I wasn't pushing myself, but I was like, I wonder what I'm going to come up with. <laughs> and then I wrote the song Fruit. And then Jess really encouraged me to think of a way of releasing music that wasn't just, you know, going down the very narrow um, top 40 route. And so when I came up with Fruit of the Month, then everything else started to like come out really quickly. Um, and the visual I'd kind of had in my mind for quite a while about um, channeling this like cyber version of, of the Dol La, Dol La Dolce Vita. Um, so it all worked out. But yeah, it's, all, it, it's quite gradual and it's definitely, it's definitely not at the start. We just go for the member on the, sorry, on the back over there. 
Hi, uh, thanks for coming. And also, I say thank you for sticking to your values with fruit as well. Um, I was kind of wondering what kind of we have to look forward to next in terms of, like, you talk a lot about themes and, like, I know other people have talked a lot about the evolution of your music and, like, the whole image and stuff as well. So what kind of political statements or, like, yeah, themes can we look forward to? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if there isn't anything. Um, <laughs> you know what? I think I need to have a break. So I... <laughs> I don't know why that's funny, but it's true. I feel like I will, um, I will definitely continue making music, but I've kind of, it's coming up to my 10th year as Marina and the Diamonds, and um, I've made three albums in six years, and I feel like I just need a bit of a breather, so, I don't know what's coming next, but whatever I do, I will do it wholeheartedly and probably in a different way to before. Um, but I'm excited to, to be able to try releasing music in a different way. Um, perhaps not, maybe not in album chunks, but we'll see. <laughs> and thank you for your very kind comments. Yeah, if we just go to, we'll go here. Hi, um, you're one of my favourite lyricists and like, it's just so great that you're here, but um, I, know I have favourite <laughs> songs that I like to sing along to, but what was your favourite song to write and which is your favourite to perform? My favourite to write was Fruit. It had about, well I was about to say it had about six sections, but it still has about six sections. <laughs> so I think it was 7 minutes 40 originally. Um, and, and so that was very fun because I was, I was just experimenting with a lot of different sections and had to be strict with myself in the end to edit it. Uh, in terms of performing, I like Bubblegum Bitch. Uh, and I also love performing Happy. Happy took quite a long time to write. Um, I, wrote, I wrote the verse and then I didn't do anything else for three months. And then I was like, oh, I know what I want to say on the chorus now. So. <laughs> Uh, that was really nice to write as well. It's my favourite to perform. There we go. We'll go for the member in the red top over there. Hi. Um, I love how you talk about music being used as a tool for um, social change or social commentary. And I was wondering if you identify as a feminist and if you think it's important or necessary for people to identify as feminist. Yes and yes. I am a feminist and I do think it's important because it's just a basic human right to be treated equally no matter what, you know, where you're from or whether you're male or female, whatever you are. Um, and I think, actually particularly lately, a, a lot of female artists have successfully um, used pop music as a medium to say what they feel about feminism. So it's, it's funny actually, because originally my talk was going to include feminism and then I thought, oh, I don't really have that much to say about it at the moment, because I've, I've talked about it quite a lot. But yeah, I think that, that pop music is a perfect tool for that. And, and actually, we can kind of track the history of feminism, at least you know, in the past 30 years, by looking at, at pop music. And my first introduction to feminism was through Madonna, so it has been very powerful. You uh, will go ahead. Just in front of me. Um, hi, I'm a big fan of your cover of um, Cindy Lauper's "Happy." Mm. Um, I was wondering what inspired you to pick that particular song. Um, true Colours. <laughs> Sorry. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No, it's good. Um, what inspired me to pick it? Um, I'd actually recorded it around the time of writing Fruit towards the end, and I'd been asked to do the cover by my producer, and I just, it really uh, was a, a, a great song to do, which fitted in really well with my visual concept, because a lot of it is a rainbow gradient. So, 
Yeah, and also I was singing in a very different style as well, which was kind of um, similar to the style of Happy, so it, it felt nice to do a song by another artist. Um, if we go for the member in the fur. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to ask about your singing style in general. In the higher register, you tend to use your head voice. Is that kind of like a response to the belting that we hear so much in the industry, or is it just something <laughs> you like doing? Bless your heart, because the real reason is I can't belt. <laughs> I can't do that big kind of Whitney Houston voice. I literally can't. So that, <laughs> that was my way. Actually, I think my voice is strange because it's, it's a way to get around that. So it's almost like, it's like, this is the low part, this is belt range here and the high. And so I just go, woo! <laughs> I just avoid the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you. We'll go next to the gentleman on the front row. Oh, hi, I'm DJing at uh, 80s club night tonight and I was obviously going to play some Madonna but I just wondered what's your favourite Madonna song from the 80s and I'll dedicate it for oh. you. <laughs> from the 80s? Yeah. Okay, of oh, Madonna? Yeah. Um, like a Prayer. That's, that's what I was going to play, that's oh, my favourite too. Really? Yeah. But hang on, was that, was that, on my playlist. Was that 90s or 89? Yeah, it's okay. just in there. Oh great. Do you fancy coming? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's in cellar anyway. It's right near her, 10.30 to 11.30. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, we'll move on to a question just down here. Hello. Hello. Um, so this is a question kind of about production. Because you talked about how you wrote your own music, like well, at the beginning, writing your own music and stuff. Yeah. And I was just wondering, when you first put it out there, did you produce it yourself? And like, if so, how did you do it? Yes, I did. And um, I'll be honest with you, it was quite rough. It, uh, it was very scratchily made. Basically, what I did was, I was adamant about not going to university. But in the end, I had to go because um, I didn't want to spend my time working in, you know, kind of waitressing jobs, this kind of thing. And so I thought, if I go to uni, then I'll get a loan and I can buy a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> and when I buy a Mac, I can start producing my own stuff. And lo and behold, as soon as I started producing my own stuff, after three and a half years of, like, nobody wanting to know, I, I started to get a lot of attention from record labels. So it's really, really important for me. And, it, and honestly, if I can do it, anybody can. It was quite basic, um, but it was enough to let people know what kind of sound I, I would want eventually if I you know, did it professionally. And so like now, is all your stuff like professionally produced? Like, do you do much production now? Or? I do, yeah. Well, with Fruit, I co-produce everything. So even though I'm not like a tech head and I don't know a lot of technical stuff, it's more about the ear and just knowing what you actually want the record to sound like. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll move now to the member in the cap. Hello. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you were to have stepped out of making your own music, um, would there be something else that you'd be interested in doing, such as acting or producing other music for other people or just something outside of the realm of what yeah. you're comfortable in at the moment? Is this if I hadn't done music or just well, generally? Well, you just step, step away from it for a, a yeah. while. Like you say, you're taking a break and then all of a sudden you decide you want to do something else when yeah. you come back from your break. Um, I would love to act, actually. I would love to. Um, aside from that, I'm not sure. It's something that actually I, I've been trying to um, work through at the moment because just like with any job, you know, whether you're an accountant or, or a lawyer, if you have a certain profession for 10 years, that really becomes part of your identity. So now I actually feel quite... Um, quite excited about perhaps doing other things, um, but I just, I'm not sure what they will be yet. <laughs> so I'll get back to you in a few years. <laughs> You're welcome. 
Uh, we'll go next to the question just down here. Hi. Hello. Um, I know you said that you feel quite detached from your Electra heart self because obviously it's like an alter ego. Yeah. I just wondered if you feel detached from your family dual self because like, I love, <laughs> are you satisfied and numb and like, it makes you quite sad to think that that's not you anymore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I don't, I don't feel detached actually. I more just see it as when I was younger. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we'll go to the member in the striped top. Um, you've talked like quite a bit about like Madonna and things. I was thinking, are there any like current or upcoming artists you're particularly interested in? Um, oh, I'm so bad at this question because any type of artist that I love just disappears in a puff of air when people ask. <laughs> Um, are there artists around at the moment? Oh, it's so hard to say. I can, I mean, I can name artists that I think are, have had impacts and are important. Um, I mean, one, actually one <coughs> example is Miley Cyrus, who I'm not really a fan of, but I can see how her talking about things like gender rights is really helpful. Um, and I suppose Beyonce as well is such a powerful entity. Any, anything that she communicates, you know, is readily accepted. So I love that, that she is bringing, um, you know, social problems to the surface. I absolutely love that. And that's what makes me feel so excited and passionate about pop like that's the kind of artist that i i really admire and can get behind move to the question right at the very back um i was wondering like during the beginning of your career was there any realizations you had about um, making it in the music industry that you didn't expect to have um <coughs> I guess not really. I think I just took things as they came and it's so intense in the beginning and, and confusing because, I mean, A, it's, it's your first album and so you don't know what the hell you're doing and why the hell people like you. You're just kind of trying things and you're, you know, you're feeling lucky to be where you are. Um, but I think in terms of my whole career, the biggest realisation actually has been in relation to having integrity and not compromising. And it's so, it's honestly, it's so hard to do that. I can't stress that enough. <coughs> and we may see artists who, who either come out and you know, we criticize or they, they move on to do second albums that are not of your liking or you, know, you think that they've changed. But just remember that they're just human beings and it's, it's so hard that you have so many messages from you know your label sometimes management at the time it's um it's a very intricate business and it's never never that simple so i would say that's my biggest realization is it's it's hard to have integrity and sometimes that means that your career is is slowed down by it for example with fruit i handed i finished the album I was so pleased with it, I handed it in, and they sat on it for three months. And they wouldn't give me a budget to mix it. So for me, that was really, really hard to deal with. So imagine every day you're just waiting and you're watching the world go by and you're thinking, I should be out there right now, like, you know, working again. And you're, you know, basically I felt like my label just didn't want to put the album out because it wasn't commercial. So those types of scenarios <coughs> aren't really communicated. And, and actually I, I want to tell people because no, um, I suppose no campaign is ever perfect. And what really goes on definitely needs, needs to be known. <laughs> um, 
So I would say for anybody in the room, wh whether you're an artist or not, I think those sometimes you have to pick your battles, and, and some battles are definitely worth fighting. I think we've got time for just a couple more questions. So uh, we'll go to the member on the second row. Uh, this isn't really a question. It's more sort of a testament to um, your fans. I just got a text from my brother asking me to tell you that he loves you with every fiber of his body and <laughs> that you've saved his life on many occasions and he thinks you're the best person in the world. So. Oh, <laughs> say hiya. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll have uh, the question just there. Um, so I do a literature degree, and I find that I now can't read for fun in the same way that I used to. Um, and you say you sort of jumped in at the deep end with music if you didn't really have any background in it. So does it has it changed the way that you listen to music? Have you seen that like as a big mm. switch over? Sorry, what degree are you doing? Oh, I do French and Italian. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. <coughs> Actually, it's kind of, um, it's very common for artists to stop listening to music once they become artists. And it's kind of a shame, but that need um, to, you know, to listen to music and process your feelings or, you know, inspire, inspire your, your thoughts about, about life um, are very much fulfilled by writing music. So I don't really listen to that much anymore, except for when I'm jogging. Um, and it's always like slamming dance songs. <laughs> we'll just have one final uh, question. We'll go to the member in the glasses, just on the outside. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm just wondering. Um, and sometimes songs will not come out as what you expect, as they would have the market reaction. I was wondering, uh, would you adapt your music style, um, adapting to the market reaction, or just uh, like expressing what you think, I like this, then I don't care what the market reacts, or you, you kind of adapt it? Definitely not on fruit, and definitely not on the family jewels, but with Electra Heart, the... Um, the big difference in the, the creative dynamic was that I was doing the songwriting, like the lyrics and the melody, um, but I had very little to do with the production. And the people I was working with were very current. So it's kind of their job to, to either follow or to create whatever the new sound is going to be. Um, so perhaps that applied to that, that time. But generally speaking, no. I kind of, I feel like when I write a song, I already have, um, it's, it's packaging or like it's sat, the sounds, the world, the, the sonic world in which it will live in my head. And then the process with the producer is communicating that and making sure that they, they get that right. I think we might just have one last question on the yes. front row here. Um, my favourite song is um, How To Be A Heartbreaker. Yeah. Um, what, in <laughs> <laughs> uh, what inspired you to write that? What inspired me? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> so this was the final song that I wrote for Electra Heart. And I kind of saw the album in the end as like a guide to love, like a, a, a musical almost. Um, or pop, soap opera. And so I felt like How To Be A Heartbreaker was a, uh, a rule book as to how to make boys fall in love with you. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marina, again for joining us this evening. If I could please ask everybody to remain in their seats whilst Marina and I leave. Ladies and gentlemen, one final time, please put your hands together. Marina Diamandis. <laughs>